three, two. So, welcome you... and uh, welcome and uh, uh, thank you for for attending. We've got a great panel here, which is discussing the future of sports production and the new norm after COVID nineteen. Uh, as I mentioned, we we have a terrific panel coming up and some great discussions. Uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, set the scene of where we are at the moment, and maybe if you look at this uh, session in a few years to come, uh, you you you'll we'll put into context where we are. Now, I think in uh, sporting terms, you could say that we're uh, dealing with COVID, and we're probably about uh, halfway through the match, so we're at half time, I would say. Uh, sports itself. Uh, has been hit pretty bad from COVID. And uh, a lot of sports, or mostly all the sports, were shut down. And we're probably uh, the area of broadcast and media which has been hit the hardest. Now, previously to this time uh, of COVID or coming up to last year, there were quite a few technologies that we were discussing, uh, we were talking about, and perhaps there was some resilience to adoption for sport. So I'm talking about remote production and cloud production, uh, maybe technologies coming along in uh, 5G. And, and really what's happened is within that time and within the, the kind of six, eight months that sports has been shut down, federations, uh, organizations and covering have had to reinvent how we're we're shooting and working uh, with sports production. So it's accelerated technologies and a lot of remote production says there's a new, let's call it etiquette, but rules of how many people are actually on site. Uh, the, there's a change of how the, the uh, actual uh, sporting events are happen, perhaps because there's no audience or if we look at the IPL, it's been covered in UAE, for example. And uh, uh, you know, when you look about the changes, it's, it's meant a rapid change in terms of how people are thinking about sports production. So uh, moving forward, and this is what we're going to discuss with this great panel, uh, where we are at the moment and uh, where we, we're moving forward. So firstly, what I'd like to do is just uh, introduce uh, Umesh. And uh, Umesh, is a founder and CEO of Pictureboard, and uh, he knows a lot about esports. He's working with federations. And he's really at the front end of the uh, uh, the, the production, sports production cycle. So, uh, welcome, Umesh. Thank you very much. Peter. Great to be here. So, uh, uh, then we just go over to Steve Norris, and uh, Steve is with Gravity Media. Uh, he has. A lot of uh, experience of uh, particularly cricket, and I think that's his, his, his key love. We all love different sports, right? And uh, uh, Steve has uh, uh, helped set up and been the, the VP for uh, uh, 10 sports and uh, in, in his career uh, worked with uh, uh, Sky Sports, BT, and several other sports productions. So thank you, Steve, for attending the panel. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Very nice to be here, thank you. Great, and uh, I would just go over to Dennis. One of my uh, uh, key things is how, uh, not just the high-end sports, but how even with COVID, uh, what, what's happened is that many of the tier two, tier three sports uh, have been uh, uh, come to life when there's no audience. And uh, uh, Dennis is doing a lot about remote productions and, uh, uh, working with with switching in the cloud and stuff like that. So uh, uh, Dennis is CEO and founder of Elevate Broadcast in Singapore. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And uh, it's an exciting time, and we're we're happy to be a part of it. So uh, and also happy to be a part of this panel. All right. Yeah. And uh, just quickly over, I pass the ball over to Zanal. Uh, he's just off his tenure at NEP. Uh, he's worked with uh, Astro Malaysia or Astro Sports. And now working with uh, with a uh, Chinese parent company called TVLB, who have the football rights for the China Super League, and working for EMG Edge Media Group Asia, based out of Singapore, doing the international general manager uh, for EMG. So uh, uh, welcome, Zanar. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. 
Great. Okay, what we're going to do is just show a video, just a short video from uh, Gravity Media and EMG. And I think it really explains why sports is probably the most special side of production and uh, uh, why, why we love to do this. So uh, let, let's roll the video. Before the action starts, and before the stars come out to play, you'll find us preparing for the moments that matter. Sensational from Gareth Bale. So when the magic happens, you can trust us to make sure you don't miss a beat. Hello and welcome to Match Night Live. Fast cars, to reality TV, to music concerts. We're uniquely placed to deliver in a complex, ever-evolving, multi-platform broadcast landscape. Founded in 2000, today we employ over 500 people. And with offices all over the world, we're experts in providing complex live broadcast facilities, bespoke cutting-edge graphics and production services for both film and TV as well as working directly with rights holders, teams and federations. Hello to Chelsea fans. Hey, Chelsea fans. We know that today, the main event is no longer the only show in town. And that means offering people more. <laughs> From unique social media content <laughs> and behind the scenes footage, all the while ensuring we continue to bring state-of-the-art technology and production now to the biggest sporting and entertainment events on the planet. TVLB Touch Video Live Broadcast was founded in early 2002, having an 18 year history. Through the years, TVLB has developed to become a pay setter in Chinese television broadcasting and production industry. TVLB started from scratch in 2002. In 2017, China Sports Media held controlling shares of the company, which allowed TVLB to build two of the highest quality UHD 4K vans adding to the fleet of OB vehicles already operating. It has developed a comprehensive portfolio of sports events production coverage over the last 18 years. TVLP provides a full range of engineering services for Chinese productions and including the world's top sporting events such as China Super League, China Team Competition, Asia Games, Olympic Games, King Cross, Spring Festivals Gala Evening, to mention a few. TVLB has become the reputable and most dazzling name in broadcast production industry. TVLB has strived and fulfilled the role of leading TV broadcasting service provider in China. TVLB adhered to advanced international standards, social values and truly achieves industry leadership and cultural self-confidence. One of the largest commercial TV broadcasters and broadcasting solution provider in China, TVLB has operated nearly 10 UHD OB trucks and HD OB trucks. While continuously increasing equipment investment, TVLB developed deep technical knowledge in combination with the highest level of broadcast equipment. TVLB has made countless successful broadcast productions, accumulating in more than 10,000 large-scale domestic and international events. TVLB. So, yeah, I hope we all found that quite invigorating. And uh, Umesh, uh, I, I wonder if you could just update us. Basically, I, I know also you do esports, but uh, you, you have a lot of contact with the federations and with the 
uh, let's say, the front end of the production, uh, which specifies the, the technical requirements. So moving forward, where, where do you see the technologies have uh, moved and what, what differences are the federations expecting uh, since you know, the COVID-19 and the shutdown, and now, now the productions are starting to happen? What are the changes? So um, I think, firstly, I think I should sort of qualify what I'm going to say by saying I'm perhaps the most technically illiterate by a country mile amongst this entire panel. Uh, I wouldn't know a coax for something else. But um, I think there are two points I want to make, Peter. One, I think it's important to think about production in the context of the consumer experience and the platform. And that's a very important piece. And typically, the way we tend to frame the conversation around content production with the Federation League Club, as the case might be, to two buckets, live, linear, long form, and typically television. And I'm in a much, much higher bit rate, broker quality feeds. And then non-live or near live, short form, non-linear, and other. And typically that's digital or social, as the case might be. And that's a very important distinction to make. I think they're different experiences, they are different business models, and they're different consumers. Uh, and what you're selling at the end of the day, and I think we lose sight of that, is that in, the, in an age when there's so much content, the battle is not won or lost by, sell, by, by, by supplying content. The battle is won or lost by supplying convenience. And the convenience piece becomes very, very important. So I think the first one I'm trying to make is that when we think about production with Federation Leagues and Clubs or publishers or, 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 or catalogs and stuff, we tend to look at live in your long form. <laughs> Uh, and usually it's a large form factor, and then non-live or near-live, short form and non-linear and then digital piece. That's the first piece. The second piece is, and this is is on the match day, and then either side of the match day, and that's also a very important distinction to be making. To be making. When I was at ESPN Star, we used to always talk in terms of the other six and a half days. You know, if I'm if I'm a Liverpool fan like my wife is on match day for about six to nine hours, she's pretty occupied. But either side of that, there are six and a half days where you have to engage with them to make sure they follow you again the following weekend. Uh, so, you know, so there's time, there's asset type, there's platform type, and there's consumer experience type. So I think once we start framing the end goal being defined by these four or five variables, then it becomes far easier for you to make choices, you know, on kit, on cruise, and on the commercial. Um, I mean, what, what was already happening, and you look at, I mean, who, who is uh, uh, pretty well known, but Chandra of One Championship was, has always been pushing the OTT, let's say, boundaries. And uh, perhaps the traditional uh, productions have been uh, kind of still in that old model. Uh, and do, do you see, particularly across Asia, uh, really all the federations, I mean, we know some of them, uh, like Rugby uh, rugby Pass, who, who basically bypass the cable, bypass the TV stations, go direct to the consumers. So, so are you seeing that, that push from the, the uh, kind of uh, federations and the, the rights holders? I think there are two questions there. I think one is in terms of how the federation maintains making money. Uh, and you know, the, the, the big money is still in the live linear long form. There's no denying that. Right. Whatever pipe, whatever screen, whatever device. I think the point you make about one championship vis a be a rugby pass. At the end of the day, the consumption on fight night or the consumption when the whistle blows in a rugby match is still going to be more often than not as a default, as a preferred default on a large form factor screen. And that fundamentally means a certain quality of video. I think where one is a big departure from other federations, because they were a new brand, they invested heavily on short form video across YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think there, the, 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 there it's about recency, relevance, and repeatability. It's a very different dynamic altogether. That's the best way of looking at it. Uh, right. Because you know, they, were, they, were, they were trying to come out there and create space for themselves. A bit like Major League Soccer in the US, who had to fight for you know, attention amongst the three leagues in the US. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw the ball over to Steve here and uh, we'll, we'll use a few uh, f uh, rugby or football analogies. But uh, Steve, I mean, on, uh, uh, you know, when you look at Gravity Media, you've already, let's say, got going on a global side of what the Tennis Open the, uh, in the US, the French Open. Uh, you, you're doing a lot in uh, Australia. Uh, in, in terms of coverage. So how have you seen the change and what 
demands, you know, which obviously has meant technically you've had to change things. Uh, has there been uh, from the, the rights holders who, you know, let's say it could be for the tenants, because obviously there's things like COVID that consider reduction of staff on site. No, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that we've seen is that the rights holders, the federations, they can't just stop playing sport. You know, that doesn't work for their business model at all. You know, they've got a business to run. They've got clubs to play, players to play. They're reliant on income as much as everybody else. And the only way they get their income is kind of having their pictures televised. So, you know, once the rules are relaxed somewhat, you know, there was a race to get to coverage, to get to some way we've got to get to coverage. Um, and that's really what we've done. You know, we traditionally, your you know, your broadcast model if you think about it, are lots of people in a truck somewhere close to the venue, in a flyaway somewhere close to the venue, all on top of each other, creating a TV broadcast. Well, you can't do that in a COVID world. So we'd have to work out ways where we can keep people distant. And some of that is technology, some of that is connectivity, and some of that is just pure geography. You know, that you can, and you can do all of these things and you can create a broadcast where you're peak keeping everybody separate. Some of the people will be on site. Some can be at remote hubs and production centers many, many miles away, hundreds of miles away. But really keeping that distance, I wouldn't say was a massive challenge. It was something that was quite easy to do pretty quickly. So, I mean, I think that would be the first thing is that we can do that. But I think we should never lose sight of the fact that, you know, the very nirvana of sports broadcasting is to have your presenters and your guests pitch side with 100,000 people behind you in the finals of the Champions League. Like, that's where everybody wants to be. And that's kind of sport. And that will never change. You know, it's just gone away for a period and we don't know when it's going to come back. But that is the way people want sport covered. Now, what happens behind all of that, that can dramatically change. But in terms of that viewer seeing that thing at the very front, I don't think that's gone away forever. I just think it's paused temporarily. So, you know, that's the first point I'd make. Now, what we can do behind the scenes in terms of distancing and geography, fibre, connectivity, remote productions, all of that can change dramatically. But in terms of what the viewer is seeing, you know, he should still be really seeing that same narrative and experience where you kind of have that experience of being picked side with 100,000 supporters of a big live event. So I think that's the first thing I would say. And then picking up what Umnish has just said as well is that I think you can draw a distinction between certain sports. And, and I do always draw a distinction between what I call the absolute blue chip sports. So whether it's the Premier League or the Champions League or the IPL, I think they exist in a world of their own. And I think you can write their own rules, quite frankly. I think what's really interesting is happening to the sort of third, fourth, fifth tier sports, where maybe the same kind of money wasn't available to them anymore. And they've got to be a little bit more clever and commercially savvy about how they get to their customers and how they broadcast and talk to their customers, whether that's OTT or direct to customer, all these different formats that they can use. So I think there is a, you know, there is a line you can draw between, you know, as we say, those big premium blue chip linear broadcasters that I think will still take the line share of the revenue, the line share of the audience in that traditional linear model. But then below that, I think things are changing quite dramatically. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, even for, let's say from my experience, I've been there on a Saturday lunch day uh, football match in Liverpool, and then the whole crew, uh, because of the truck can't move and set up in the same day, we've all moved down to Arsenal and we're all looking at each other and saying, why are we doing this? Uh, so, you know, uh, so, you know, certainly things, you know, should change, but at the same time, and, you know, I, I was based in, in Singapore, and I, I would go to Tampanese Rovers, and uh, I, I feel sad for a lot of the, uh, you know, the real hardened football fans who just, uh, they don't experience the old, old Trafford or the uh, Anfield or whatever, you know, there, there's nothing better than actually being there, you know, I, I don't want to stop the, the coverage, <laughs> uh, but uh, but what, what, one of the things also close to my heart is is the lower cost production. So I know, and I can understand the, the high end, uh, you know, let's say, saying that we've got enough cash, we can do it how we like. Uh, but what I've also seen, and I, I've got people who have covered third tier football in England, uh, and that's happened because no fans are allowed to go there. So the only way they can get revenue until something like mid next year in England is by covering. So Dennis, you know, I'll, I'll pass, pass the ball over to Dennis. And I know you're doing remote productions and uh, yeah, helping get that cost down, maybe for the tier two, tier three, or maybe even tier four, which could be done on a mobile phone. But uh, uh, what is your experience, Dennis? I think um, the, the thing about COVID is COVID is exposing the underbelly of a lot of these clubs. And uh, 
they were already struggling before we went into COVID. And truly the business model was, was struggling. And that's a bit of technology, the cost, the uh, ad revenues decreasing, all these things were putting stress within the market. And um, all those things are irrelevant. The fan is a, is a separate category. And the fan is the one that's just uh, trying to support and trying to uh, uh, consume the content. And because of these uh, pressures, um, we have to come up with new and creative ways to get the content. I'll take you back uh, just a, a short while. Uh, we had an issue uh, for, for Southeast Asia, which was the Sea Games. And um, some of the countries were not getting coverage because they weren't the, the premier uh, 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 event. And so we, we got a call that said, right, we got permission to do coverage of the football match, but we only have three hours until it goes live. So you're not going to roll an OB truck. You're not going to do any of those things. And so we had to roll technology, uh, in this case, Live View, within three hours into Malaysia and set up a, a studio in, in uh, Thailand and able to produce the content, do the replay, do the commentary and everything else. And it's possible. We were able to do it. The games went live. Everybody saw the coverage and they were happy with it. And this is the the dynamic that's that's quite interesting. You know, it's is the the commercial side of the the sport uh the most important piece or is the fans and being able to see the content the most important part and um you know, we see so many different sports i mean tonight one championship is is doing a live event in in the indoor arena in singapore and they're you know uh fighting like crazy to 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 produce sport and why there's there's okay there's 250 fans in the stadium tonight which is a a big undertaking and it's it's commendable but really the fans are all over the world that are going to watch it tonight on cable and and uh streaming and everything else and so i think this whole situation changes the game plan in the sense that we now have to rethink technology rethink remote production rethink cost models of how we produce content and make it possible for not only the tier one that can maybe stomach it, which I think it's even harder for them today, but as we go down the, the chain and, you know, as, a, as, as a, a parent, you know, being able to watch even school sports, uh, which most parents are locked out of the schools today uh, is important. And so how do we, how do we facilitate that and in, continue to encourage and, and build the environment that will, as, as, uh, as we said already, uh, return. We really want to be back in the stadium. That's where we want to be. And uh, so we, we have to uh, play this game for now. Right. I mean, I, I just uh, uh, asked Sanala a question. I mean, you're, uh, you're, you're going across borders as well. So there's, there's issues in terms of obviously based in Singapore, there's only so many games to cover or events. Uh, so uh, how do you think the new technology is going to help doing productions in different places, uh, being based in Singapore, maybe into Malaysia, Indonesia, or, or whatever? Well, I think uh -huh. at the moment, we need to really depend on local production teams. As, as for myself, I have actually established production team in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Philippines. So where we have events around the region, I usually get to them to provide the production. But I agree with Steve. I think uh, the traditional coverage of sports is still the only way to go because you, having a, a sport with no crowd, I mean, I was watching a few of the sports, it's just not really there, you know? And I think it will sort of like... Uh, affect the standards of broadcast in, in, in my my sense, you know, because the way I see it, broadcast is where we have, like what Steve say, commentators, we have about 50,000 people in the stadium, who works with floor managers and boom and everything. And and that's, that's, that's what TV production is all about. That's the exciting part of actually covering sports. But if we turn down and having like right now one championship having 250 people in the stadium and then the riggers have to leave the stadium. Once the rig is done, they can only come back during d rig cameraman without no cable bashes have you because there, there are too many people uh, in, in the cage. I mean, I don't think that is 
the way to go. I mean, like I said, I, I hope what Steve says is correct. Everything will get to normal in maybe March or June next year. Um, but on the other hand, which I, an article that I read, we're talking about all this broadcasting and production. And very, I read an article which is very interesting that what about the players? What about the sportsmen themselves? I mean, there was a, a, a big issue about the badminton where BWF is basically not just canceling every every other matches and all the players have like now no income. And BWF, after making so much money, is not even sharing that pot with the players. And do you think the players will last that long and start playing again once the COVID is over? I don't know. I mean, that could be one area we need to look at where yeah. we, we will not have the same level of players. Well, well this, this is I where, I mean, and there's an interesting question and really the elephant in the room about, you know, it's a technology session, of course, but uh, it's it's the revenue and the income. And the, the question is London-based sports marketing agency, Two Circles, uh, estimates that the sports industry may lose uh, 61 billion US dollars in revenue. And basically it's asking, uh, kickstarting remote production could help minimize the loss in revenue. So what, what do you think about that, Amesh? On, yeah, I, are they concerned? I mean, surely the the commentators want to be at the stadium, right? Yeah, I'm going to be careful what I say. Gareth, the CEO, is, is a good friend of mine. Um, so I think, look, I think there's two ways of looking at disruption. One is in terms of downside minimization, which is what, you know, they're talking about remote production, cost of ownership, all that kind of stuff. And the other way to look at it is in terms of, okay, we've probably run the course. And, you know, if you take a three-year view, what's it going to look like? Where are the new areas of growth, right? Uh, let me make two different points. I think if you look at the onset of pay television, and I was part of that, Steve was part of that in India as it went from west to east, you would be surprised by the lack of quality in what stuff went on end. But it was actually building an ecosystem over 10 years, which became extremely large so there are things it's like the famous bill gates quote right people overestimate what's going to happen in one year and they underestimate what's going to happen in 10 years so i think that's a way i think we need to think of this as a process and then try and then situate the argument that's point number one point number two and we were doing this in a workshop with a client uh, on tuesday we perhaps need to look at sport just as hollywood has looked at movies today in hollywood you've got two very distinct pieces you have the blockbusters right, where it's a $100 million movie with a $50 million marketing budget and an overage for the actor for another $50 million. So, you know, from the get-go, you're looking at $200 million to break even. But the number of sequels are going to go up, more of the same, similar plots, similar treatments. It works for everybody down the value chain, from the exhibitors in the cinema to the production guys, to the talent, to the script writers, all the way down the various different windows. What people haven't noticed in the last 20 years is the emergence of alternative cinema, independent cinema, which has actually made various non-anglophonic titles and directors come to the fore. But they're two different segments. So I think there is some shrinkage perhaps in your core business, but that spawns new areas of growth. And I think, I think Dennis, you mentioned this about schools, and I think Zeno mentioned this in terms of not being, you know, parents not being able to see kids being trained. I think there's a massive opportunity in what I call schools, universities, an amateur competitive, just below the professional competitive. I think that's a massive opportunity. Uh, and the second piece is a bit more in terms of where, where gaming and some of the niche leagues come together because now there's a generation of sportsmen and sportswomen who play games. So that's an, another new genre of engagement. That's the yeah, way I, I mean, would... there's, there's also, uh, yeah, you look at the trend and I think the expansion of sports because there's a certain amount of uh, let's say oversaturation, but when you then look at say women's sports, you you know you look at women cricket or soccer, rugby, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know there's expansion from there as well. Uh, but the problem will be, as I say, this is the elephant in the room: is it, it can't be the same cost of production because you can only divide the audience out of so many sporting events. If I may just come back to that, I think we could argue that there's been so much growth and profit making that even content, which is not a blockbuster content, has still been produced at the same cost per hour of blockbuster content, simply because there's money on the balance sheet. 
Uh, so in many ways, you could argue the toss that there'll probably be fiscal discipline to sort of say, actually, this is a B category product, and therefore it needs to be given B category production. The audience doesn't mind, the platform doesn't mind. Okay. So you, you'll end up almost becoming like a tiered studio, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a movie slate. That's just my view. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll put over to see what I'll say before I do that is, mm. yeah, you know, the sports production have always been incredibly inventive. And you look at cricket and you look at the stump cam, the thermal camera, the, 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 the replay, uh, you know, I mean, they have been resilient. They have been inventive. I know. OK, we'll call it Gearhouse, but Gearhouse have been really at the front of a lot of that early development in cricket and microphones where the umpire is and umpire cam, umpire mic, all that kind of stuff. Now, we've got a question on uh, AR and maybe VR as well. So, yeah, how is that going to help? I mean, uh, these kind of uh, new technologies are going to help kind of, let's say, reduce cost, get that, that production as if it's... Uh, huge, huge production, but rather than $100,000 for one one event down to $10,000 or maybe $2,000. Um, I think we've got to be really careful. But think, you know, when we talk about remote productions, you know, um, there are savings to be made. There's no doubt about it, but it's not going to be the savior of the business that we move everything to remote productions. You know, the scale of losses that we're talking about currently uh, we've never seen it before. They're quite biblical. You know, if you kind of believe what's happening in England at the moment, it's £100 million a month that's being lost in Premier League football. So it really depends which numbers you believe. But the numbers are astronomical at the moment. Remote production isn't going to come, isn't the kind of knight in shining armour that's going to ride to the rescue of that. There are savings to be made in remote production. I think the business was going that, there, that way anyway. And I think there are some really strong environmental and logistic arguments as well, is that why do you need to be flying tons of people and tons of equipment all around the world all the time you don't need to be doing this if you can work more effectively with connectivity and distribution and those things that you can reduce those things but it's not the silver bullet you know remote production is not the silver bullet to the problems we're facing at the moment having said all of that and what you said about kind of second third tier even schools things what has happened is the cost of producing television has come down we know that that's a fact you know Automated cameras, remote solutions for broadcast distribution, so much easier to get your customer out, customer now, you know, OTT, direct to customer. All these things are really accessible. So the cost of producing television has come down. And therefore, you should be able to get to a wider audience because, you know, you have it's cheaper to do so. But I think we need to be really careful about thinking that somehow remote production is going to offer these huge savings and kind of come in and save the business. There are absolutely savings to be made, and it's all part of that chain. But I think you need to look at lots of other things as well in terms of how to save money within the okay, big... Okay, well, one of the other things, that I'll, I'll pass the ball on to Dennis here, which I think is a great question, and uh, uh, one of the other kind of technologies and areas. But one is the production, and then the, the other is the audience and how people are viewing and the the, the form of the audience. So we there I say maybe a rest of young, but we're all over 30 here. So the question is, uh, sports is grappling with the audience under 30. That's radically different uh, than older fans in terms of what they want, uh, what they watch, uh, you know, uh, out of broadcast. Uh, is this altering the dynamics of the sports production? And, you know, are, are you modifying? And I think, you know, let's say when we were kids, you, you made a program. Uh, and you transmitted it. Now it's going to all these different devices and people are viewing maybe catch-up TV, different areas. So so uh, how is the coverage changing depending now, and you, I know, Dennis, you've worked a lot with one championship, but in terms of the viewing, uh, how do you see that changing and how is technology going to cope with that? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Technology is not easy, right? When we're trying to change a, a model, it, it, it comes at a lot of uh, uh, pain and suffering to some degree. But I think some of that pain and suffering is, is good in the end. Um, you know, if, if you look at what we've had to do recently, doing productions from Thailand, where the camera and the activities are happening in Thailand, doing graphics and commentary and, and uh, you know, switching uh, in another country, uh, doing uh, these type of things, it's not easy. Uh, it's actually easier to sit in one location and to do it all. Uh, we know it's not practical, but it, it's taking some some time to adjust. The technologies are making it easier. You know, we've used products like GV Amp 
in order to allow for remote contribution to be able to do better uh, low latency uh, monitoring over standard internet. You know, one of the things that was happening was before COVID, we had a, a transition towards 2110. You see a great a lot of examples in Australia and other places of moving to 2110 and remote production. Europe was going the same way. Um, but that worked well when you were going back to a broadcast center. As soon as you took out the broadcast center and you can't go to a broadcast center anymore, you can't get a hundred gigabit worth of uh, fiber into your house to do the same production. We have to change the technologies again. And so um, that's happened. I mean, the technologies are able to function, um, but the um, operator environment is distinctly different. And and this is one of the things that we we really have to work through is, is what is the right parts of that uh, operator environment? Um, esports is one of the ones that tackled that early and 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 maybe more easily. Stadium sports are difficult. You know, the environment of a stadium sport is is challenging. When we think about things like uh, off road biking, uh, you know, running, uh, swimming, uh, all these other type of sports, we don't have the same challenge. We never had the same crowds. We never had the same environment. So if you did a uh, uh, a tour de France, um, yeah, the, the the audience is exciting to be there, but really it was TV coverage that was making Tour de France work. And so if people are not necessarily in a compound to make that same sport work, we still need the cameras, we still need the helicopter, we still need a lot of things. But the reality was you were never in one you know, location to produce it like a stadium. And so I think we kind of have to pull apart the model. We have to say, you know, what are the sports that are more easily translated into remote production? What are the ones that are more difficult or that we get a big benefit from being there? I know my nephew has been in esports for a long time and he used to go to the stadium in order to do all the graphics for the stadium. And, you know, he was working for a very, very large esports company and he was flying to Europe, to, to, to China, to wherever. And so he was working once every week or every two weeks. He was doing his job. Um, it's now flipped. He's doing everything, even before COVID, he's doing everything from his home. He has fiber into his home. He has cameras in the stadium. He can see everything that's happening. And on a single weekend, he's doing six, seven, eight events. His income has actually gone up. It's skyrocketed. And so we, we think of it in the downturn and what's happening in a negative way. But for the people that have adapted and found ways to make it work, actually their income increases. If I'm a commentator and I can only do one sport on a weekend, because I'm flying or traveling, I have a fixed amount of income that I can make. If I can all of a sudden do six or seven different uh, events, my 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 uh, my cost base is is different. My income base is entirely different, and so and I get to go home with my family on the end of the weekend. So I think you know there's there's a lot of positives that are happening. I think traditionally we want to work in a certain way. But uh, COVID's given us a few different things. It's forced us into a model that is not in a telecast center, uh, which gives us new opportunities. And it's forced us into a model that says, did it work? It might have been different. It might have been difficult, but did it work? And is there a net benefit to how it worked versus what we were doing traditionally? And I think this is the, the breaking point on technology. We will have the tendency to go back to where it was previously. But is there some areas of that that we should not go back? And that's that's one of the big questions. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and also I think with, with COVID, one of the, and certainly issue uh, when we look at India and different stadiums uh, is the connectivity. So I, I think governments you know, around the world are going to have a view probably of connectivity I, I, another elephant in the room, particularly uh, uh, for India, is 5G and how that rolls out. But, uh, uh, you know, a, a question I have uh, for Zanar, which is quite interesting, is uh, what kind of impact will 8K have on sports production? So is is 8K, I mean, let's get 4K maybe out the way first. But, do, you know, we, we always know... Uh, <laughs> we are at Broadcast Olympic. Asia. Fantastic. We're at a Broadcast <laughs> Asia. It had to come. It had to come. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think it, you know, it's... it's I a, think, a, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, in Southeast Asia, I mean, where <laughs> most of the channels are just and digital, <laughs> and most of them don't even have access to 4K, I don't think 8K is going to make any <laughs> yeah. impact. 
if, you know? if you don't mind, Peter, to, to jump in there for a second, the, the, the interesting part is Southeast Asia was so slow in the uptake in many respects. You know, they were sitting in SD, some places still analog. Um, it's interesting, but even countries that I work like Myanmar, we've now leaped and, and everything I'm building now is 4K. So we're not building anything that's not 4K. So we're building studios, OB trucks, everything in 4K. And you would say, why in Myanmar? But the, the reality is the cost differential has plummeted. And yeah. so why not do it in, in 4K? And, you know, in March, we're expected to, to launch a 4K terrestrial channel in Myanmar. You know, Singapore is not even there yet. And so some of the things are very odd in the sense that as we do technology jumps, you know, uh, 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 why not? AK, probably not, uh, not in a short term, but, um, you know, in, in a production standpoint to capture in 4K makes a lot of sense versus uh, HD or, you know, particularly 1080i. So 1080p and 4K makes a lot of sense, um, yeah. but uh, it's harder yeah, exactly. for the people I mean, that moved early. We, we, we know traditionally in moving, you know, let's say from uh, composite to component to uh, SDI and so forth, that eventually you get such a turnover, let's say, of UHD that it's actually will be cheaper than having an SD device because they'll just be more more made. We're, we're on, on the last run here, as it were, we're on the last uh, running stretch as we finish this uh, uh, bit of a marathon. So uh, very relevant question. Uh, uh, Star TV, and I, I'll throw this to Mesh from the commercial perspective, but uh, Star TV, uh, Disney bid a huge amount on the IPL, of course, and, and now the changing scenario post-COVID. Do you see Star TV being able to recover the huge investments uh, made in the next three to four years? Now, one of the, uh, you know, the kind of frustration, I think, for the sport uh, certainly is that with COVID shut down, you know, what sports can do for a nation, for people, emotions, and, and it could be time-wasting while they're stuck indoors. It's frustrating when there's so much demand, of course, uh, but you can't supply. But, but what is your feeling in the next few years of what's going to happen with the IPL and return of investment? It's, if you sort of look at the return on investment, uh, I think my, my short answer is yes. In that particular instance, that platform, that property, uh, and I'll qualify by two different things. <laughs> um, if you look at the ICC contract, which Star also has got, that's probably between seven to nine million dollars per match, right? Yeah. Not all matches feature India. Sure. If you look at the IPL contract, it's between eight and eleven dollars, eight and eleven million dollars, depending on where the forex ends up. Because don't forget, you're earning in rupees, you're paying in dollars over that time period. Every match has at least half a dozen marquee Indian players. So it's like having Bollywood blockbusters on the go every night. So it's a very different dynamic from an ad sales perspective and from a subscription perspective. That's the broadcast side. If you look at the growth of Hotstar as an install base, dwell time, concurrency, it was tracking between 10 and 12 million concurrent users for the IPL last year. 18 months prior to that, I had the CTO of NBC who actually had the Super Bowl and he was saying, oh, we do between 2.8 and 3.2 one night. Hotstar was doing between 8 and 12 on a dozen consecutive nights. You dial forward 18 months later, there was some talk on, I think, Facebook or LinkedIn about how the concurrency on Hotstar this year is not that big. It's only 5 million. Just look at the expectations. What people are forgetting is that, A, a lot of people are watching at home, so you don't need an OTP service. Two, a majority of the IPL is behind the paywall. So what you've done is you've got a 50% conversion rate over 10 million free to air streaming, which is now 5 million behind the paywall. That, to my mind, is phenomenal. So there's two different ways of looking at it. One's the pure math, and the other is more in terms of how you're migrating your one property across two different platforms, television and then OTT. So the answer is yes and yes again. Okay. Uh, as a yeah, final, yeah. final Peter, I, think I think I'd add to that what Nesh just said is that I think it would be fair to say that most people on this panel would sort of think that actually the sports rights cycle was we were probably getting to a period where it was definitely inflated, highly inflated, and where are we coming to the end of that period? You add into that COVID, I think you've got this kind of double impact, is that you had a cycle that was probably at the very top. You then add in COVID, that actually presents quite a lot of problems into the market because you've kind of got this double impact. Yeah. Okay, I, I think I have to have a final comment. So uh, I'll just close with 
you know, the, the two elephants in the room is COVID and uh, actually the money side of things, which is going to affect the, uh, the technology moving forward. Uh, we, we think, OK, maybe 8K is a bit far off, but there, there will be a, a, a jump in remote productions going forward. And uh, certainly the, the probably tier one will be slower to really embed that for year, a few years to come. But it will allow productions in terms of the, the tier two to the tier three to, to jump forward. And uh, uh, so I'd, I'd like to just thank uh, uh, the whole team and the whole panel here. And uh, I, I think we won. I'm not sure whether it was by 3 nil or, or, or what the final score is. Uh, but I'd just like to thank you all uh, for, for attending this panel and certainly some fantastic uh, practical insights of, of what's going on. Thanks, Peter. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks again. Thank right. you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Enjoyed it. Nice. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank, thanks for all the comments that are, or questions that have come in. So uh, uh, thank you for all you guys out there viewing. So thank you. Much appreciated.